Good morning, everybody. Welcome out to Board Game Breakfast. My name is Chris Yee. I'm Wendy Yee. And I'm Roy Kennedy. Today, we've got, uh, we're kicking off the first week after the Spring Spectacular. So, Kick it. Uh, it's still spring. <laughs> yeah, but is it spectacular anymore? Legally uh, not. Legally distinct from spectacular. Uh, <laughs> I think Roy's hair is spectacular. It's something. That's like what's it. different about you. I really you. like it. Yeah. I'm a fan. Yeah, That's I was good. wondering if anybody in the chat was going to bring it out, and now there definitely are. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the chat would definitely comment, the second one of our appearances is ever so slightly different. Correction, I think Chris's shirt is spectacular, not Roy's hair. I do like those shirts. I do like the shirt a lot. Yeah. yeah, they're fun. Well, we also want to thank our sponsor for this episode. We have a copy of... It's a copy of Roller Coaster Rush available mm -hmm. as, a, as a giveaway. If you want to enter that, go and email us at contest at dicetower.com. Uh, and this is, um, this is USA only. Uh, and this is a game that we actually played during the Spring Spectacular itself. Yeah, so you can definitely check out that video. So this is one where you're building a roller coaster, and your roller coaster is a marble that you're dropping, and you're basically seeing how far you can get it to get the momentum to move that marble across, um, and you're building it up, and you're trying to get money so that you can build more roller coaster. Email us at contest.dicetower.com, and in the subject line, you have to put the phrase, coaster, I wonder where that came from, and you have to answer this question, which maybe you could even find by watching the playthrough under this part of. Oh, can. snap. You gotta answer the question, what are the two different actions you can take on your turn? <gasps> mm. So, if you wanna watch some marble madness, then go ahead and Go ahead and watch that one. Uh, enter this contest. So thanks again to Pandasaurus for sponsoring this uh, this episode. Is there anything else we should announce? Uh, Dice Tower East. Yep, is, tickets are available. Ooh, There's so a few stoked left. For Dice Tower East. Yep. So that one you can go ahead and register for that. Um, other than that, I don't think we have too many other announcements. We might as well get the episode kicked off, right? Let's, Let's go to it. some contributors. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Meeple University in the Dice Tower. Today we have Goblin Folds from Thunderworks Games, the newest release in the same Ulos World of Ulos universe. And this looks like a filler game. Yes, it is, but it is actually quite thinky. Yeah, it's a clever little, clever little card filler game. And I'm always on the lookout for card filler games. I think they serve a great function uh, within the hobby. This one is sort of halfway between a trick-taking game and a bidding game. Mm -hmm. It's all about playing cards at the right time to get cards to build a tableau. And within that tableau, you're trying to set collect icons, you're trying to put cards in the right spot, you're trying to make patterns, and it's very hard to achieve everything. Yeah. It's one of those, it reminds me of tile placement games like Calico or Cascadia that you want to try to meet lots of objectives. You want to reach for the sun, I've said it before, but then end up in dead. <laughs> and it's got a much more uh, interesting uh, and interactive draft than those couple of examples. Yeah, so it's, it, the artwork is very interesting as well. It's similar to the other role player artworks and it has got a neutral player in a two player, but it still works. Uh, three players obviously is more interesting and then the amount of cards that you bid uh, be, be, is the same with higher player counts different you know different arrangement different things that you have to adjust as well but it's a tighter game in higher player counts Indeed. yeah goblin fault recommend us uh, and thanks for watching bye Happy breakfast everyone, today I'm here to talk to you about In the Shadows of Demios. It's the terraforming Mars uh, book that you can get. The logic is that the different corporations are trying their different terraforming methods and they're very set in stone of we crash asteroids into the planet. We are going to try and do it sort of eco line, uh, greenery wise and different things like that. And part of the plot line, uh, not a spoiler, on the back of the book is that they don't see eye to eye. And when a sort of very bad event happens, was it just an accident? 
and that's pretty much where it sort of goes and explores and it's really interesting how it actually captures the different corporations what they're trying to do the conflict of the corporations that you get in the board game where one player is playing very differently from another based on their corporation because that's giving them their sort of special abilities and it also has like the personal level of you're following a few sort of characters around getting to know them why they've actually even gone to mars to help terraform it we're not going to see the end of the terraforming the characters touch on that as well and that's really interesting that the characters sort of do discuss how they've left earth behind they've left their life behind why they've left it behind in some cases and sort of go on to go look we're starting the process we're building start they're starting to build this city and stuff like that anyway that is the first book in the terraforming mars line it's one complete story you don't or at least it doesn't seem to expect you to have to go and get the next one to find out what happens it's wrapped up in the book but they could continue from there if they really wanted and enjoy the rest of your breakfast Thirty years ago, a game came out that is now we don't even call it this name anymore. The game is called Beyond Balderdash. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which was a sequel to Beyond, as we all know. Ah, uh, I, I think you got that backwards. Yeah, it was, a it was like a sequel to, to Balderdash. That's the oh. joke. No. <laughs> That's the joke. So, uh, so Beyond Balderdash. I don't know exactly when, but at some point, basically, this expanded the. Uh, they made just regular Balderdash this because original Balderdash was just weird words and just, you had to make up definitions. Yeah. Right? Did you ever play the basic, basic version? I don't think so. I'm not really sure 100% what the differences were. It was literally just a stack of cards with a word and a definition. And gotcha. so everybody just had to make up some scientific y, dictionary sounding definition, which was terrible in my family because half the people in my family were like, a dog, and the other path of my family was like, let's Being make up this really overly fancy sounding definition. And you would assume that the children in the family would do worse, but it was definitely your dad. <laughs> it was definitely my dad. Yeah. <laughs> What his dad was never accused of being the most creative person. No. Uh, so Beyond added like a score track or like... <laughs> so it added different categories okay, and different gotcha. types of things. So then you so it's have not a, just dictionary definitions. It exactly. added in, yeah, so like weird movie plot lines. Gotcha. And so okay. you're like, given the name of the movie, everyone comes up with a plot line kind of story, and then you figure out which one is, actually goes with the movie. Yeah, so it's, it's more fun when you have the different categories. Uh, what else is there? There's also the... Um, uh, what do you call it? The, the initialisms, mm -hmm. right? Or like the, the letters. Uh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. People call them... What is that word? What is that word? Like, uh, like OSHA. Uh, anagram, not anagrams. Like OSHA <laughs> is one where the, the abbreviation... Acronyms. 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 Yeah. yeah, there you go. Even though they're not all acronyms because you don't always pronounce them all. Right. right? But like P-B-B-L-M. You don't say the P-B-B-L-M. Right, that would be an acronym technically, right. but like those initialisms are fun because then people are like, oh yeah, the PBBLM, uh, that clearly stands for the public, blah 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 blah. You yeah, know, yeah. so having those other categories in Beyond Balderdash makes it more fun. So many times these games become less about like actually trying to trick people and more about just trying to call back the silly callbacks from all the other rounds of the game. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's definitely those moments. I appreciate that they're so. Weird, like the actual answers sometimes are weirder than stuff that I can right. come up with, and that's why it kind and of I like, like blends that. in with everybody yeah. else's weird stuff. It works so well, Sunday. Yeah, there, there's uh, silly laws is mm -hmm. another one. So yeah, in you know, in the state of Kentucky, it's illegal to blank after mm -hmm. 10 p.m. and you're like, oh boy, eat ice cream. Yeah, you know, and, and so it just sometimes the actual answers are strange. You know, uh, what is what is the phrase like stranger than fiction? Yeah, you know, yeah, uh, and I love that. I think one of the interesting things is that Beyond Balderdash is clearly the inspiration for so many other games. Gotcha. Do you remember we went to the Balmond's place? We played a game called Library. Library. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, and then uh, just last week, you know, everyone here at the office played the game of Quiplash. Yeah, we did a so live stream of that. Like that. I mean, Quiplash is very clearly Balderdash, right? Right, but with kind of like the the questions are ever so slightly different, right? They're not like define this word, but 
the kind of and instead of everybody doing things, categories. it'll be two people's things, and then you have to pick in between those two people, you know, and you don't yeah. know who did it, you know, that sort of thing. It's very. I mean, I guess you don't know who did it in Boulder Dash either, but yeah, it's very, right. Yeah, in Boulder Dash, you're trying to pick who did it, right? Instead of voting who's the best or whatever, right? Right. Yeah, I think that one of the I think that one of the downsides of of Boulder Dash though. After, I mean, because like 30 years ago, this game was amazing and mm. continues to be amazing, I think. The only downside, I think, is just kind of the downtime. We're like, okay, here's the category, and everyone's like heads down for like a little bit, and you have to wait for that one person. For, for me, a lot of this, it's, it's hard for me to play sometimes because sometimes you have to write paragraph, like write a movie plot. Holy smokes! Oh, a little like, piece of paper that's and, like, big. I'm, I, I get like a lot of anxiety about that, like forced creativity, or like, oh man, am I gonna spell this thing wrong or say this thing wrong or whatever? And people would be like, I don't get this. And when somebody says, oh, I don't understand what this says here, that's obviously not the the one, you know. So it makes it kind of like that, a lot uh, of pressure. That really matters to me that the person that reads it, that they do a good job. Like right. they read them all beforehand, they get an idea of what it's gonna say, and they don't stumble over stuff. Right. We're like, oh, I don't. I, I can't read this person's handwriting. Like, well, okay, well, that's not the answer. So yeah, yeah there's, right. clearly not. There's those little right. moments of fragility, which I think is is why like the Jackbox games being all digital, like you know, mm -hmm. you still maintain that party atmosphere, mm -hmm. but it kind of takes away some of those like moments of fragility. Like I think I would sooner kind of be like, well, let's fire up the Jackbox than necessarily pull out Baldur Dash, but it's still right. a great time whenever we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all that's right. fair. So there you go. Any other thoughts on uh, we're good there? Yeah, yeah, I mean, sweet. Let's watch right. some contributors. Hey, I'm Jordan. Let's talk about our weeknight game. This is Millie Fiore. This is a big box Reiner Knizia game. I'll be honest, I don't think he puts out a ton of games in this size box. But um, this one, of course, caught my eye for a couple reasons. One, I do enjoy Reiner Knizia games. Um, I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm a, a, a huge fan, but I, I do enjoy a lot of his games. I really enjoy the kind of simplicity and some of the elegance that comes from a lot of his designs. And this one has a mechanism, and I, I don't really know if it is what the name of it is, but it's something that I really enjoy in games over the last couple of years, and that is that chaining of actions. And so Gonshan Clever was kind of probably the big one that came out a couple of years ago and that kind of... Uh, kind of lit that that mechanism on fire a little bit. But then more recently, we got Fleet the Dice game. We got uh, Three Sisters. Those are both kind of roll and rights that fit that genre where you're just kind of moving from, you know, you do something here and then it gives you a free action here and then you do this here and do this here. And this one is a board game. There's no rolling. There's no writing. There's no flipping and stuff. This is a strict board game, but it has card drafting. You're going to have these cards that have different actions that correspond with the different spaces on the board. And you're gonna take a card, play a card, and wherever, you, and you get to place it on one of the sections, and depending on how you place it there, you might get a bonus action over here. And then you get to do that same thing over here, and then you do something different over here, and that each section scores differently. And it just comes together in a really uh, cool package. It also is surprisingly interactive. A game like this, where you are actively jockeying for spaces on the same board, and the way that you position is definitely going to affect the people around you. It's not necessarily negative interaction, but it is definitely interactive in that way. So I, I really enjoy how this one kind of hits my brain and all those kind of like mini, uh, mini happiness, uh, you know, marker. It's just so great. I really enjoy Millie Fury. I'm Jordan. Thanks. Hello, my name is Aaron and welcome to One Word, One Question. Today's word is learn. And the question is, how do you prefer to learn to play a game? Option A is with the instruction manual. You like having the physical copy in front of you and walking through the steps. Answer B if you prefer someone to verbally tell you how to play, and then you just kind of follow along as you play. And answer C if you'd prefer to watch a video or an online how to play or tutorial to learn how to play. As for myself, I am in group A. I definitely prefer having a physical copy in front of me, both for video games and board games and even my car. Uh, I just, that's how I visualize things and that's how I learn. Uh, so as always, let me know your thoughts in the comments. I look forward to reading them. And in the meantime, I just have this horrible nightmare that complex video games had stopped including manuals and I couldn't even reference the controls and
Uh. All right, coming for the Dice Tower this week, we got a couple of things uh, today. We have two more live things, the first of mm -hmm. which is going to be Z is playing. Do you remember what it's called? He is playing Card Crawl Adventures. Oh, yeah. He said nah. that it's, a, it's like a small card game that someone suggested for him, so he's going to check that out. Oh, yeah. cool. So that's what's happening, happening in 45 minutes. After that at noon, Z will also be doing the Q&A, so load up all of your questions because he will have no answers whatsoever. Especially about that card game. Yeah. <laughs> He's just going to stare at the camera for an hour, and I will be watching every second of it. Oh, snap. What else? Uh, so we have the normal live shows. Um, I, I guess we could have addressed at the beginning of the show. We should have show. addressed at the beginning of the show. Yeah. So Tom's not here at the moment. Oh, yeah. That's I am what's different. not Tom. I forgot that. I thought that was the if, Tom's he if Tom takes his hair off, his hat off, he has this hair. No, I'm just kidding. Do you remember there's that little span of time where he did have his hair dyed all different colors? I do remember right after I dyed my hair last time. Yes, that <laughs> happened. <laughs> anyway, so Tom is at Gamma uh, this week, and so he's he's out of town. Uh, but he recorded a bunch of stuff that's going to be going up. He's doing five like top five lists, five great games. From various different years. He's basically going through the entirety of the 90s. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. So, uh, if he doesn't have his hair dyed, then by the end of, of this week, he's going to have he's gonna have the uh, Jonathan Taylor Thomas part. Oh, yeah. The end of the middle part. Oh, yeah. there Is you he going to wear his parachute pants oh, in the video? Oh, my gosh. I hope so. Oh, that'd be Please! Great. I want to see 90s <laughs> Jinkos? <Tom>. Jinkos. Jinkos. <laughs> Did you, were you a Jinkos guy? Most definitely. What are you talking about? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Uh, but we still have their typical live shows, right? So obviously we talk about today, Wednesday, crowd surfing, Thursday, smorgasbord. Uh, and so... And a top ten. Uh, and the top ten list on Thursday is going to be top ten games that we wish we had when we were teenagers. So mm. that's going to be Joey, uh, Camilla, and myself. That's an interesting topic. I'm curious about how you guys are going to come at that. I, too, am curious about it. Um, less curious about my own list, but I'm curious about the others. Uh, and is So Clover going to be the number one nature game of all time? We'll have to find out. Mm. Uh, reviews coming this Oh, And then also we're going to be reposting all of the stuff from the Spring Spectacular. All the live plays, we'll be chopping those up throughout mm -hmm. the week. Yep. Uh, and still, even though Tom's away, the uh, board games shall play. So we have a couple of different reviews going up. Yep. Um, we're going to have, uh, Mike is going to take a look at Ostia, one that I've been excited for him to uh, explain to me, but never taught me. And so at some point I'm going to have to... to uh, bully him into playing it with me. Pathogen, also one that's getting uh, a look taken at. Uh, Joan of Arc. The big review for Sunday, I think the big review, well, there's two of them. One is going to be Inside Job. Oh, nice. And the other is going to be Skyrim, the board game. Oh, Ooh, cool. Sweet. So two very different ends of the uh, box size spectrum. Uh, box size sure. spectrum there, yeah. But, yeah. There's no Everdell big box, but... Not quite. But anyway, so yeah, that's that kind of the, the main stuff coming from the Dice Tower this week. Let's jump to some more contributors. Hi, everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Today we're talking about Blazon. This Blazin. is a game all about kind of medieval, uh, ancient heraldry, which is the art and science of making these shields that are kind of these family crests. Uh, what a cool, unique theme, right? I love seeing a theme that I've never seen done before. Yes. So you're drafting these cards, you're playing these cards onto your board, which represents your shield, and then on top of that, what you're trying to do is you're trying to follow all these rules of ancient heraldry, uh, which uh, is kind of symbolically wrapped into the game mechanisms, right? But you have to all these different uh, cards that represent the materials that the things are made out of, the animals, the different shields, all the different awards that your family has earned or whatever as, the, as, as the, your family history has kind of evolved over time. So this is a really cool theme. Uh, it really boils down to drawing cards, drafting them, and then placing them on your board following the rules. Yeah, so this game is really easy to learn, but it's one of those games to where um, just because it's easy to learn doesn't mean it's easy to master. <laughs> I, I personally know as somebody who has never ever won this game that it's not necessarily super easy to master but I had so much fun with that anyway and I always like it when I can play a game I can be fully engaged not win and be like that was such a great time and Blazin definitely did that for me. Whenever you're playing this game it creates this kind of this picturesque thing that you've done right you've got a, your own personalized family crest that you made as it goes to the game uh, so every time you play you just want to take a picture of it uh -huh. I think it's, it's kind of this, this, the history wrapped in with this game is just so cool right I love it when there's the games that combine science with the game mechanism or history with the game mechanism and that did that really well um, so I think this is a lot of fun I'm this is gonna be a keeper on our shelf everybody if you want to hear more from us you can find us on YouTube we are Ryan Bethany board game reviews everybody this is Ryan uh, Bethany hoping you have a happy healthy breakfast bye, bye everybody guys. 
Good morning everybody and welcome to another segment, a bot game and thousand pieces. So we are still on the villainous series and today we will look at Ursula. So Ursula's goal is it to have the crown and the trident in her cave. And to achieve this she has the help from well I don't know how those I don't know the names in English and Germany, it's Flotsam and Jetsam. And I really don't like the names, but maybe you can tell in the comments how the English names are. And um, she can do the shape shifting and pull and fortune souls and a bit more. If you want to spoil her game in the destination deck, you have a ton of heroes who will help you. We've got the dingle hopper. Yeah, let's do the jigsaw. <laughs> watching and if you want to check out other jigsaw stuff i do you can find me on youtube and instagram sue burgundy puzzle thank you very much bye bye all righty we're gonna look at the best of the shelf and this time it's going to be well i'm about to say the, the shelf number in the video anyway do it and i forgot so let's hit that video clip please we're continuing along here our shelves with 21B. B as in back. And this is the back of the room. First off, Cursed Court. This is a game about uh, kind of bluffing, kind of having some information, trying to bid on a few different figures in the middle of the room. Nid of Valir, this is a set collection type of a game where you are doing three almost kind of simultaneous quasi auctions. Glory to Rome, a Carl Chudik very. Uh, interesting and involved card game with lots of different kind of weird flows to it. Slapshot is from Columbia Games here, a wheeling and dealing game where you're kind of managing a hockey team. The Duke and the Jarl are right next to each other, and they're both abstract games where after you move a piece, it shows you how a piece moves, and then you flip it over to the other side, and it'll describe a new way that that piece moves, and there's a, even a third one, I think, kind of in this trilogy. Fuse, sitting next to Flatline, I know this bothers Tom because the box sizes are so different, but Fuse, a real-time dice game where you're trying to prevent bombs from going off. Flatline, the sequel to it, which is why they're next to each other, wherein the bombs have gone off, and it's a real-time dice game, both by Kane Klenko, where you're trying to then take care of the patients. Zendo is an odd little one where uh, there's, you have, uh, it's from Looney Labs, the little pyramid games where the, you have to Try to follow someone's rules about how pieces are, are laid out. Fallout Shelter, a little worker placement game in the Fallout app kind of universe. Shaolian engine building game. This is the deluxe edition with Warring States. Caper Europe, a really good little card drafting game. Botswana, Reiner Knizia, um, kind of, well, you're trying to figure out the value of different animals. It depends on which card's unplayed. Wyatt Earp, I know nothing about except that it's signed by Richard Borg and Mike Fitzgerald. And Tom has it, and it's one of the two games from this series that is actually on here. Get On Board is the uh, yellow re-release of, of um, the bus game. Uh, Uchronia, another Charles Cuddick, uh, Carl Chuddick game I know nothing about, except that I'm pretty sure it has wild and wacky cards that are completely out of balance, and everything is balanced because everything's imbalanced. Kanagawa, a Bruno Catala, Charles Chevier game uh, about creating pieces of art. Sea of Clouds, which I don't, I don't know too much about either, but Diamant... A fantastic, fun little push your luck game. That's the shelf. Yeah. All right. So finally, a, finally a shelf where I've played more than one game on it. I know. Is <laughs> someone called you out last week actually because Tom was like, "Yeah, well, I, we're going to do the Simon shelf, but I know Wendy's played, you know, maybe two games on it, so we're going to go to this other shelf." And then the first thing you yes. said was, <laughs> "I played I've one game." Played, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> played a few on here. I There's some good these. stuff. There's some good stuff. Get on board is the reprint of. Let's make a bus route, Let's make right? a bus route. I clearly mm. forgot the name of that as I was filming that. I was like, it's that bus game. <laughs> Not called bus. There's Diomat on here, too, which is ink and gold. 
and I love Ink and Gold just because it's like that super decision, like pressure luck. It's like really fun pressure luck where sometimes when people press their luck too far, like they'll lose, but you can have people out there that do a really good job and just continue to get tons and tons of resources. It's, it's a such good a fun game. game. Yeah. Yeah. When For you're sure. the last person left and you're like, 15. One more time. Yes. One more time. And then they start like getting 14. so much money and you're just yeah. like, please don't stop. Please don't stop. Please don't stop. Like everybody wants you to keep going so you lose everything. Uh, it's great. It's such a it's such a fun dynamic. Um, I know Mike's favorite is going to be Shao Lia. Um, but how about Shao Lia versus Nevalier? What do you think he likes more? I know he really likes Nevalier too. I think yeah, one might edge out Shao Lia. To Mike, uh, Mike's favorite, Shao Lia. But Botswana is oh, really he says close. he says Nevalier is great. Sorry, I should have actually read the chat. <laughs> well, he listed like a bunch of them, so I don't know if that counts. Yeah. yeah, Mike is a Mike is a big old cheater. Also, he's using the Dice Tower account, but so is Camilla. The world also, is in I'm pretty shambles sure that was Camilla and chaos. That said that, by the way. That well, was that's Camilla true. That said that. Yeah, Shaolia is, uh, is, Camilla said, Shaolia is Mike's favorite game. Exactly, I'm <laughs> sure. She knows. They're so like I, this. I also really like Fuse and Glory to Rome on here. Those ones are really good as well. I feel like Glory to Rome is one of those, like, ah, holy grail games because it's that whole legal battle thing. Mm. But it is still a really good game. It's yeah. one that I feel like actually holds up to the hype. My favorite from the shelf is definitely Fallout Shelter. Like, I was shocked and surprised by how good that game was. It's like a simple, like, little worker placement game, but it, it doesn't seem like it should work just because it's like, oh, it's based off of an app game. I like Fallout, but the, the app, you know? Right. But it's, like, super simple, and, like, you get to fight off the little monsters that go into your, your shelter, and you're building up your resources, and it just, like, works. It's just super simple and really easy to get into. Yeah, I, I remember being surprised by it as well, especially because it comes in, like, a tin lunchbox. Mm. I was like, this is going to be terrible. Comes right? in a tin based off an app. Based off of a video game of yeah. sorts, I don't know. Like it, it, it sounds like it's everything working against it, but it's fun. I like the production of it. Yeah, I like the the clear cards the clear with all monsters. the little monsters. They like mm -hmm. go in the different rooms, and like you lose points if they're in your part, so you have to fight them off. But then people want to. It has a little bit of that Lords of War deep feel of like people want to go into your area, and then you get benefits from that. That's yeah. kind of fun too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah, I think my favorite off of the shelf, and kind of like you alluded to, Wendy. Unfortunately, is Glory to Rome, which is mm. one you can't. Buy, but hey, come out to Dice Tower East. <laughs> I play, Get a ticket. I play Glory to Rome. It's fine. I mean, I, I people really, really love that game. Like, what's the hype for it for you? Like, what makes that game like? It's your the multi-use cards. One? I really like multi-use yeah. cards. It's one like of my favorite too, game but, mechanisms. Mm. And I, I, I think part of the reason I like it so much is because I know how to teach it. Gotcha. And so uh, I remember, I think it was last Dice Tower East. There was uh, there was a group of four people. Opening the rule book to to this copy and like trying to read through it, and I was like, "Oh, I'm kind of busy, but gotcha. I'm gonna jump in and help this, you know, help this this uh, group of people out because that's cool. If like once you get the concepts of it, once you know where stuff comes from and goes, it's like a pretty, I don't want to say simple game, but like it's playable. But like trying to read that rule book is awful because you tuck some cards here and that upgrades this over right. here, but you play cards yeah. over here and sometimes you have to discard them, but you can grab them and yeah. The way to pick one no one can get, Chris. Yeah. I'm well, like I said, hey, come out to the convention, and apparently uh, I'll jump in and I'll, maybe I'll teach you a game. Just look at the box helplessly. Just just cry a little bit, and I'll come out and I'll teach you. Get your tickets for Dice Tower East. Make it happen. Please. And weep openly. Anyway, so that's the, that's the best of the shelf. What is up? My name is Matthew McCack, and this is Smashing Buttons and Slamming Cards. This is a segment where I talk about a video game I love, and I connect it to a board game I love. And I am continuing on with my top one board game for a video game genre. And this week, I am talking about zombie games. Now, last time I spoke about, like, horde-like games where there's just a bunch of waves of hordes coming after you. Now, in zombie games, usually... That is the case. Sometimes it's not. But usually there's also like objectives to be had in the game, right? So as you're going through these waves of zombies, there's also like certain things that you have to get done. Like maybe you have to uh, fill up a car with gas or something so you can like drive off away from the horde of zombies that are coming after you. But anyway, the my number one game for uh, zombies as a video game is Zombicide. Any sort of Zombicide, pick your poison. My personal favorite, which is the one I'll talk about, is Zombicide Black Plague. The reason it's my favorite is because it uses the supernatural zombies. There's not a whole lot of um, zombie games that use the, the supernatural version of a zombie. It's usually sci-fi where it's like, oh, there's this virus that went around and like, you know, and those are cool. I love those, but I really love like in, in Black Plague, 
there's like a necromancer that's like raising them from the dead. And I love those types of zombies. Those are so much fun and they're just like going around trying to eat brains and things. Now in the uh, in the board game, Zombicide Black Plague, uh, they're not trying to eat brains or anything, but you are going around, um, again, this is cooperative, um, and with your friends, you all have special abilities uh, that, that you each have and you're just kind of going after zombies. There's usually an objective involved and there's tons of scenarios, but anyway, that is my pick for the week. Thank you so much for watching. If you like, you can check out my and my brother's channel called Room 51. I'll catch you next time. <laughs> I'm going to be Tom today and review some other stuff. So I wanted to review Shadow and Bone. This is a Netflix TV show that is based on a series of books. And from what I understand, it's like a big, long series, but this particularly covers hmm. the first original trilogy. In it, um, I read some of the books or all of the, like the first three books in this trilogy, but then I just watched the show. Uh, what I think is really interesting about this is the magic system. So it's a fantasy kind of thing. Um, but the magic system is if you're born um, being able to have magic, you're born a Grisha or whatever, you get tested as a kid, they find out you have it, you go join, get conscripted to the military, whatever. Um, but they consider that science of like you can control things because you're, you're, you're doing everything within the, the laws of physics that they have. You're not creating or destroying mass. You're just using what's there gotcha. to use your whatever magic, you know. Science. Maybe he's born with it. Maybe it's yes. Grish, Grishin. <laughs> Maybe, it's Grishin. <laughs> Maybe it's John Grisham. But what's interesting is then they have what they call magic, and it's it's like taboo. You're not allowed to use it gotcha. because you are creating mass out of nothing. It'll still and ring so, that buzzer in your ear. Yeah, so you don't know what is going to be the consequence of that. And so hundreds of years ago, some guy that controlled darkness created this huge rift of darkness full of monsters. And so this country was split in half. And so there's an interesting bit of politicalness. There's the, of just like, how do you deal with a country hmm. that's completely blocked because they can't go north, they can't go south because they're at war with those countries. They can't cross because you get eaten by monsters in the dark. Um, and so it's just, it's a fascinating, interesting little series with a cool magic system. So, interesting. I like it. This I would is, give it. This was the second season that just came this out? This is the second season, which is basically the second and the third book together. So I don't think there's a third season that's going to come out, but they might do like a side quest with some other characters later on. Um, there might be another show for that. But I'd give it a 7.5 and I'd give the books an 8 is I think what I'd give in, at the end of it all. Hmm. What is it called again? It's called Shadow and Bone. I it's have, the Grishaverse <laughs> series. I have told multiple people that you have been watching the Cloak and Dagger series. And so... <laughs> I assume that's very different. <laughs> no, yeah. Cloak, Cloak and Dagger is Marvel. It is. But it's a uh, it's it's a one syllable name with an ampersand and then another, and another syllable name, another like kind of short name, two syllable name, right? One sounds like darkness, kind of. I've mm. also called the show Smoke and Mirrors. Like, when did one that Smoke Smoke and Mirrors show? I think that's what I told you this morning. I asked Wendy what the name it was, and I got this cover, which is hopefully the right one. It's, it's on a, Netflix, yeah, right? No, yeah, that's a Netflix. That's a Netflix one for there sure. Yeah, I always forget the name of it too. I'm like, there's a thing and a bone. Like, I remember bone, but I never remember shadow. Doesn't make sense. So anyways, yeah, Shadow and Bone. There you go. Hello, Proti here, your remaining content creator, and today I will continue my series where I will talk about a specific part of a game, and today we will take a look at Coop. Coop is a small card game, a bluffing and a deduction game, so to say. You have uh, two cards in front of you, and uh, they have special abilities, but when it's your turn, you can announce whatever ability is present in the game and uh, the other player can say that you're lying, that you don't have uh, one of those cards with the ability that you mentioned in front of you, or they can let it go, don't say anything, and you can make that ability even though maybe you don't even have it in uh, that person that has that ability in front of you. So really interesting here to read what uh, the table is doing. It's uh, purely just like I said, Said, a bluffing and a deduction game it's not taking long it's interesting and of course the main element of uh, of the game are the cards and one card that I really like or a, a person uh, with an ability that I really like is the ambassador 
uh, in the game. The ambassador gives you the possibility to uh, change the cards that you... So you have two cards in front of you, face down. And when you play the ambassador, uh, the, it cannot be blocked. But somebody, if they are saying you have, don't have the ambassador, you cannot do the ability, then you can check to see if it's right or not. But the point is the ambassador is really nice because you draw two more cards from the deck and you can choose from the four which two you want to keep in, um, in front of you. So really interesting. And beside that, uh, the ambassador can block the um, uh, if uh, if, somebody, uh, if somebody is doing the steal ability, so to say. But really interesting here uh, the flexibility that you have with the ambassador. Of course, you can announce that you have the ambassador uh, and make the ability even if you don't have it, and hope that nobody is telling you that, that you uh, don't have the ambassador. But just like I said, uh, interesting coup. It's an interesting bluffing game. Goes fast, and the ambassador is a nice card that I wanted to discuss about today. Uh, so. Have a nice breakfast. Still has a little bit of time to. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's great, you folks. You just watched one heck of a board game breakfast. You watched a puzzle get made. Yep. You saw Camilla and Mike fighting in the chat for control of the dice tower account. Mm-hmm. Who ended up winning who on that one? Camilla. Who did win? Mike just doesn't know it yet, but it's Camilla. <laughs> ah. I was like, I keep seeing Mike typing, and I'm not hearing Camilla's fingers moving. So. All right. Well, we'll settle this off screen. Um, yeah, come back in, uh, I can't see the time for me, was it in 25 minutes or so yep. for Z playing uh, Card Crawl Adventures? Crawling it up. And then make sure to come back for his Q&A at noon. So until next time, my name is Chris Yee. I'm Wendy Yee. And I'm Roy Kennedy. All right. Have a great breakfast.